You're listening to Victory Apostolic in Winsboro, Louisiana. Thanks for tuning in. Praise God. God is so good. He's amazing, and he's just flat out awesome. I'll put it that way. God is just so good. Got to get this passcode typed in. Now we're good to go. All right. So you may turn to the book of Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. I'll give you just a minute. All right. Genesis chapter 28, verse 20 through 22. Verse 20 through 22. And it says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, And will give me bread to eat. And keep me in this way that I go. And give me bread to eat. Focus on that. And then it says, And raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Lift your hands and just say, God, right now, Lord, we're going to take in the word. God, we're going to, God, anoint God our minds and our hearts. God, we want to listen, God, and God, take the fruit of the vine and listen, God, and just soak in, God, what you're trying to minister to us today, God. Let us just, God, live, God, on what is taught, God. Lord, let us seek, God, to more understanding of your word, God, because you said your word gives us wisdom, and God, let us apply that to our lifestyle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. You may be seated. And there you go, Dad. I did it. I told him to be seated, so we're good. Coast is clear. My title is Setting a Pillar, Embracing Our Commitment and Our Eagerness. That sounds like a mouthful. Sound like a nerd, don't I? But I found these words to be pretty fascinating, and just like me and Cam, we're both like that. We love... uh, the way words work. We like the way, uh, especially when you read a KJV Bible. There's some doists, shallists, I just made that up, the witchifs, all the THs in there. But when you read it and you love God and you love the word, you're going to really enjoy the oddness, may I say. It gets, it gets interesting. But anyways, we face the long and mysterious expedition in our walk with God. We come across the good and the bad. That's just part of our walk. And sometimes we go through uh, things that seems like a blur or a long season. You know, sometimes in life you may have uh, incidents that go by fast. You know, and that's typically rare if the enemy's fighting you and it just goes by in a blur. But there's also seasons, and we go through certain seasons in our lives. Uh, and I want to, I've tried to find the most relatable character for you, and I find uh, Jacob to be the most appropriate. And in the book of the Bible, we see that he was the least favorable by the father in the household because Esau brought food on the table, the fine furs from hard work after his hunting trips, after he was the provider. I mean, he was the ideal son for any parent. Like, he was the guy that, would uh, provide, he would help uh, with the food. He just took care of the main needs. He was the firstborn in ancient times. Being the firstborn had many privileges. It meant when your parents retire from their responsibilities and uh, from old age, you would uh, gain the riches, glory, and their land and their cattle, all the riches. And uh, you were just the most favored back then, especially Esau. But for the second born, uh, it was Jacob, or known as the deceiver, the less capable person to be the, you know, tough guy or the provider. Uh, He was uh, recalled as the plain man dwelling in the tent, in the tents. The plain man dwelling in the tents. And what that means, he didn't like to go outside much. He, He just liked to be inside. He liked to help his mama cook and clean. He was definitely a mama's boy. And he... He was looked down upon because of that, and there's nothing wrong with that, but according to the Bible, that just wasn't the standard for being the uh, son in that time. You were, it's, you know, Esau already had a lot of 
bonus points on him. And, you know, he's the firstborn, and he was good at hunting. He, he could use that bow, crossbow. He could shoot the deer first time. He just had an eye like an eagle, okay? He was just, he knew what he was doing, but, you know, poor Jacob, he, he probably picked up the bow and had the bow right here and then put the a bow. Uh, he had the bow and arrow and then the bow and then did it the opposite way. He's probably stupid when it came to that. He didn't know what he was doing. Uh, but um, we don't know. That's why he liked to cook and clean. So we'll give him that. His uh, father, Isaac, still loved, he loved Jacob a lot. Uh, Isaac loved Jacob, but not like he favored Esau. He loved Esau way more. And we know why. There was a day when Isaac was going to bless Esau, and Jacob, as we know, deceives his father and steals the blessing from Esau. What a jerk. But can you blame him? I mean, you're already the second born. You're not the tough guy, but you're like, I know what to get, Esau. I'm just going to go ahead and steal the huge blessing that comes from my father. Like, dude, like, I, he's got beef with Esau, but, I mean, we can relate to that, can we? And so you see that after he stole the blessing, he runs away in shame. He, he, he's not proud of it either. You know, as the Bible said, he put on the goat's fur, and uh, they said it was, it was just because they said uh, Esau, he was just this very masculine, didn't like to groom. He was just coming, uh, just uh, fur and all that. He was just this rugged guy, and so Jacob's like, Okay, that's not me at all. So I put goat's fur on and tricked my dad, and he'll think it's Esau by touching my arm. And he got the blessing because Isaac didn't know any better. The Bible said he couldn't see. So the only way he could tell which son it was, and I, I, it's, I guess they must have sounded a lot alike because he couldn't tell by the voice. He just had to tell by the arm. He touched the arm and said, that's Esau. He got the blessing, but it was Jacob, the deceiver. And, you know, he ran in shame, and his uh, life was chaos, but God still communed with him and guided him, even, that, even for the fact that he was a deceiver and a sinner. He still guided him because he loved Jacob. He chose Jacob, the, the, the deceiver. You know, Esau didn't do anything wrong. He just, he was just the son, and he was just hunting, wanting to do good things, and you know, Jacob, they were perfectly fine at first. There was nothing wrong with anything until jealousy stepped in. That's when things started to get a little uh, wrong, and, you know, he got a little hasty. So when jealousy steps in, sin will obviously step in as well. And so he ran away in shame. God still was keeping his eye on him. He still was guiding him. But, you know, when we sin, we fall short of the glory of God. That doesn't mean God leaves you completely. I want you to focus on this. Right. To me, I feel like a lot of us can say we can relate to him. You feel like the rogue uh, of your friend group, your family, a sinner, the person with more shame than anyone, and God chooses you out of those people. It doesn't make sense, but that's how God works. Right. Praise God. God chooses you because you are the most sinful person, the most evil person with iniquity, because our hearts are evil. I may see you and you're a kind person, and you may see me that way too, but we still sin. We still sin. And that's just uh, the iniquities that we are born with. We are born with sin. But one thing I want to point out is, at the birth of Esau and Jacob, Jacob grabbed Esau's heel. And what that represented was that he's taking the birthright away from Esau. Grabbing the heel meant he's pulling him away, getting in the line, the first in line. He claimed the blessing. As you see, Jacob is always fighting for a blessing. He's always finding, at first, he deceived into a blessing. But then you're going to see where he fights for a blessing. Amen? And what, it, what did he do in his distress? He built an altar. He built an altar, a pillar of an altar, on a hill and made, and made it of stone. And he poured oil on top of it to anoint his altar. That was his and God's unique style of making their own way to fellowship and prayer. Supplication and peace. But what I'm asking today, what is your altar? 
It doesn't have to be a pillar of stone, and you don't have to anoint it with oil. What do you do each day that is the altar of what you seek to stay committed in this life with God and have that eagerness to want to keep living for God, even after you sin. Amen? Why do you have it? What makes you want to repent? Is it fear or conviction? Is it also that you just love God? Or is it all of that combined? I call it our pillar, our desire to embrace what the enemy is constantly trying to steal from us. Our lives and our commitments and our eagerness from this life with Jesus is long at times confusing, but I say that I trust him. I say that I trust him today and that in my personal walk with him, he just wants to walk with you and guide you. He wants to have fellowship. He doesn't care if you're a sinner. He doesn't care if you failed in times past or if you failed today. He just wants to walk with you. Jesus, just like the good Samaritan, he walked up to the man, and just because they didn't have the same race, just because they didn't have the same beliefs, the same lifestyles, he still helped the poor man in distress. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your name is, where you come from. It's about what God wants to do. He wants to walk in your life. Don't listen to other people say different. Amen. But yet you, for, you refuse. You feel like, oh, okay, just because the Bible says God uh, wants to walk with me and I've sinned. Well, what is that? Supposed to, so what do I do? Where does my part come from? Where does his part come from? Like, how does this meet together? And so through our pride, you are the knowing, the unknowing, but he is still the knowing. You don't ask God the questions. You don't read the Bible. You don't go to church on set, and you realize it's like, okay, now you see. Now you're starting to see why it's a little hard and difficult for God to come into your life. It comes from you, and it comes from the heart and your soul. It comes from all of you, it ta- and sometimes it can take a sacrifice, but obedience is better than sacrifice because we, when we obey just the natural human response to God, we all worship Jesus. Even the people in the world, they worship Jesus. They don't realize it. There's something, I've heard where people say that when you inhale and exhale, it's the same as saying Yeshua. When you breathe, it's like Yeshua. It's like you're breathing, and, it, and it's saying Jesus. You're, you're, naturally, when you breathe, you're saying Jesus. So even all these people in the world who may not do right, or they're worshiping Satan, or they're just doing things in Hollywood or anything, I want to point out that the human response towards Jesus through breathing is saying Jesus, Jesus and Jesus. We naturally praise God. We naturally worship God. We naturally have the knowledge to understand that we want God and God is wanting to get into our lives, but it comes from us again. I say that. Take away all the pride. He is going to help you come through it. It's not going to be easy. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. God created us, created in Christ, Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. As soon as he made us, we were made to worship. As soon as he made us, we were made to praise. As soon as he made us, we were made to work. Hallelujah. Give God some praise. He He deserves it. He deserves all the praise. Hallelujah. Amen. We are called to work. Like we were talking about Chloe, her entrepreneurship. It's, it's a desire to still work. You know, we see many people not having that desire anymore. But God made us that way, not just towards our jobs, not just towards our families, but it's towards him. We work to praise. We work to worship. Amen. Living for God isn't always easy. It also isn't backbreaking all the time either. It's a, it's a certain process you need to go through. It's, it starts in the mental world. First of all, you got to tell yourself you can do it. The word can't doesn't exist. The only time can't does exist when you already made your mind up to not do something. Okay? But what I'm saying is there is a time for peace and there's a time for destruction. Some, life happens. I cannot, you know... There's car wrecks, there's disasters, there's natural disasters, hurricanes. Sometimes, even though we pray, God, 
please don't let this hurricane destroy this uh, civilization. Lord, please don't let someone die in someone's family. Sometimes things happen to work in us. I don't want to change the way God is setting up, setting place this whole world. I don't want to change. I don't want to pray against his will, but I will pray for God to at least give it a thought, a chance to observe why I don't want this to happen. Amen? God is a God that it's sometimes you can ask him yes or no questions. He'll give you a no. He'll give you a yes. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's hard. But what I'm saying, try don't be like, I'm going to watch what's going to happen. I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, hey, God, where are you? He's not going to respond. First of all, fear. That's right. yes. Condemnation. We have fear. And that's not natural. That is the enemy coming into us saying, hey, he's not going to talk to you. He's not going to be on your side. But look, try it. Oh. Try speaking to God. Amen. That's good. That's good. Try speaking to God. Amen. Later on, when Jacob was uh, back up on his feet, for another path to cross through, it was to find a companion, a wife. He traveled to a land called Haran to find a woman named Rachel from the household of Laban, her father. When he finally made it, he made a commitment to work for Laban for seven years and for his love for Rachel. Uh, it caused those years to feel like a blur. It, uh, when asked Laban for his daughter after the seven years have come to pass, he gave him Leah, the sister of Rachel, and not Rachel at, at all. As we can see that, how ironic scripture can get, we see that the, the deceiver gets deceived. He gets tricked. He, he, the guy who tricked his dad and given him the blessing, next thing you know, when he goes to find a companion, a wife, he gets tricked by her father. He gets the same medicine back to him. Laban then said to Jacob, you know, he was just like, oh, you wanted Rachel, my bad. I thought that was Leah you loved. You know, he knew what he was doing. He tricked Jacob. He knew. He, he, had, he had it in his heart. He knew what he was planning all those years. And he's, and he's like, it was Leah you loved. And then told Jacob he had to work seven more years to be like, okay, my bad, I gave you Leah. Here, work seven more years to get Rachel. And, with, and you can see how committed Jacob is. He's like, I'll work the, another seven years. And so we're mentioning so many different things in Jacob's life. You know, uh, he married Leah and Rachel. And now we're, and we'll backtrack. He, he, it's like he stole Esau's blessing. He fled from Beersheba, his hometown, made an altar because he, he seeked for God, went to find Rachel, was tricked and abused. After 14 years, finally met his goal. Okay, this guy does not have the best life. I mean, he is living in anxiety. He's running. He's terrified. He can't even settle with a family because he's always running. He's just got things going on. He can't just have peace. But I find this part in Scripture, it's so fascinating. It's in Laban's dream, God spoke to him about Jacob's true character. And, his, and here's the relationship with Laban. Uh, you, it's in uh, Genesis chapter 31, verse 24. And God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Pause for a second. That's unique itself. You can't even talk good about someone. God was basically saying, go there, show your face, don't do anything, back off. God was already helping Jacob. He's defending Jacob because he knows this guy wants to keep abusing him, using him for Laban, using, and it's wrong. And so, and God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night and said unto him, take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, good or bad. Now it says, this dream served as a warning to Laban, instruction him not to harm Jacob as he was preparing to leave with his family and possessions. Notice he couldn't do good unto them or bad. God wanted Laban erased from Jacob's life forever. Later on in Scripture, they build an altar together, saying neither one of them will cross this boundary mark. So this time the altar wasn't just a pray for forgiveness. It was a boundary mark to say, okay, 
God's moving on in my life. I don't need this person in my life. You may have friends. You, have, you may have people in your life, and God's like, they need to get out of your life. They're choking you. They're choking the harvest that I want to grow in you. And that's exactly when you need to build your altar and make an agreement. Say, God, this is my boundary mark. God, nobody's going to cross this mark because it's you and I. And that's how it's going to stay. And God, he establishes forgiveness and peace. And now uh, we see that the positive things about Jacob later on is, you know, he finally left, he finally left captivity from Laban. He built an altar for God. He moved to his own land with more riches, riches, more cattle, and more glory. Now he could start his family. Years go by, and he went back to the city from which he was born, and then feared again. So he got to settle, have peace. Boom, it's like another uh, dark path, dark thing coming back into his life. And we can te- like relate to this so much. It's like things go good, things go bad, things go good, things go bad. And years go by, he went back to that city, and he feared his life because Esau's brother. He feared because he was near. That night, God sent down an angel, and they wrestled. This time, Jacob didn't steal a blessing. He fought for it. After Jacob wrestled with God, he was left with a limp. Uh, this event is described in Genesis chapter 32, verse 24 through 31. It says, uh, you know, it's explaining, During the struggle, God touched the socket of Jacob's hip, causing him to walk with a limp. Thereafter, this physical reminder symbolized Jacob's struggle and his transformation as well as his reliance on God. The limp served as a treatment and actually, it served as a testament to the encounter and the covenant God established with him, marking a significant moment in Jacob's spiritual journey. That's right. Tonight, you may have physical pain. You may have mental pain, damages in your body. But look at it this way. You may have, it, maybe it's just a reminder that your reliance is only God. You can't depend on the doctors anymore. You can't depend on the therapists anymore. It's when it comes just you and God, one and one. And I'm telling you that there is a testament being served. I'm telling you there's about to be a transformation. And it's going to be be uh, symbolized through God. He's going to show that your physical pain is going to represent how you need him and that he's the only way he can heal you. If you're going through mental, uh, you know... Um, illness, God can talk to you and say, it's okay if you don't understand these things. I want to help you. I want to nurture. I want to help take care of you and your body and the physical and mental pain. We go through this, and I hear over and over again, people uh, are just, it seems like they're just rotting through their just lifestyles and how the sin can eventually add up so much, or it it could just be the enemy constantly fighting, and it seems like is you're just being damaged and and there's no shield around you but I'm telling God God is your hedge he's going to he's going to shield you and he's going to guide you and he's going to give you peace amen thank you Jesus for now it's a reminder later it was a miracle we suffer we go through shame but through the power of God's forgiveness and his everlasting mercy we be forgiven and glorified amen we will be abused, taken advantage of. Be the rogue of the family. Be the rogue of the friend group. And what that means, you're the only one. You're different. You're, you can't relate. You're the black sheep. You can't relate to anyone. But God, he sees you as the person who keeps their eagerness for him. We want to continue to see him, and he sees that. He sees that. He does. And God has not left you. He's been with you since day one. Amen. Amen. I want to stay committed for what God has fought as long. And he's fought so long for me. Now I want to fight as long as I can for him. Because what a blessing it is to have a God. God who created the whole universe. You uh, You can put aside all the presidents, all the government, all the powers and principalities in this world. But you can realize that the head of the universe is on your side. 
man cannot do anything to you. You're completely oblivious to that sometimes, but man cannot harm you. Amen. I want to stay committed. I want to keep walking, even if I'm in pain or if I struggle. It's like, though he slay me, I will still not be against him, right? We will, we will also trust in him. We, will, he may, we may go through physical pain, mental pain, but that's still not a good enough excuse to run from hell and eternity. Physical pain on earth is much better than eternity, uh, in pain and eternity. I seek for heaven. I seek for these people in this world. And I love God's word. I love the scriptures. I love the words. That, I love the punctuation. I love what it means to me. Amen. I love what God is explaining through scripture. I love what he's explaining through the Holy Ghost. I love what he explains to me every morning and every night. God is just so unique throughout the day. He's going to send, maybe it's the daily verse on your iPhone. Maybe it's somebody telling you their favorite Bible scripture to help you through your day. And it's like God's personally speaking to you. Get ready. Tomorrow, it's going to ha- it's gonna happen to every one of you. Even me, it's gonna, God is going to use people in your lives to encourage you. Amen. I got two scriptures and I'm about to close. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Psalms chapter 37, verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. God, we thank you, God, for the word. God, we praise you. We thank you, God. We're going to stay committed committed, and keep our eagerness for you, God. We love you, God. We thank you, God. We're going to continue to serve God. Minister us to, uh, tonight and tomorrow, God. Lord, we seek God understanding and wisdom. And you know that. God, give it to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If we could, I would love to turn to the book of First Timothy. And uh, this is chapter two today. Amen. And like Brother Adriel said, I got to type in this passcode too. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. In first Timothy chapter two, uh, in verse five, we'll go five through six, it says, for there is one God. That's a good way to kick it off, isn't it? For there is one God. It says, it says, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It says, who gave himself for a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to jump down, and I don't expect you to just flip over here. I'll just go ahead and read it. Psalm chapter 90 and verse 12. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Amen. And before we move forward, I want to point out in that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 through 6, it says, who gave himself for a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There's a theme right here I want to point out of appointed time. Appointed time. And then in Psalm 90 and 12, it says, so teach us to number our days. Amen. This is implying the passage of time. This is the, implying the changing of seasons, the tick of the clock. When it says number, the meaning of that in the Hebrew means to allocate, organizing, setting apart the days, in this case, enumerating or enrolling, registering something, right? Dividing or portioning out with intentionality. We're being intentional about how we're numbering this. And, and the prayer in Psalm 19 and 12 is, so teach us to number our days. How many of you know the Lord is our teacher? Amen? He's our teacher. That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. There's a secret here that they're sharing with us. It says if we could be intentional with the way we segment some things, we can begin to apply our hearts to wisdom. This is the trick to wisdom today. Amen? And I want to preach what to do with a time machine today. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you glory. We give you honor, Jesus, for what you're doing in the house of worship, Lord. I pray, God, that you would bless this word, God, that it may, Lord, seep into our spirits, God, and change us, God. Let all flesh step aside in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Everybody said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you may be seated in the house of worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's the house of worship. It's the house of prayer. It's also the house of the word. Amen. It's, a, it's got a lot of names. Amen. On June 2nd, 2000, let me go ahead and put this on. June 2nd, 2023, a movie entitled Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Okay, you may have heard of it. 
Hit theaters, all right? It came out. This cartoon film is what it was, contained a recurring and an important theme of tampering with or protecting what's called, and you may have heard this if, you, if you're on TikTok or Instagram or any of these, canon events. It was a canon event is, is the phrase. It was a canon event. Look at somebody say, it was a canon event. It was a canon event. All right, we're going to explain what that means, okay? So canon, C-A-N-O-N, not with two N's, not like a canon, right? This is, this is one with one end in the middle of the word, meaning established or agreed upon constraints governing the background narrative, setting, storyline, characters, etc., and a particular fictional world. So in other words, it's how the story was planned to go all along right? So it's canon. It's canon that this happens. It's canon that a group of writers or directors agreed that this would happen to this character at this point in time. If I'm writing a book and I include a character, the fact that I included that character means that that character is now canon, right? Of course, the term canon does not come from the Marvel Universe, right? Predating Spider-Man and the adventures of Miles Morales, Peter Parker, Gwen, Stacy, you know, was the idea of canonicity of the book we just read earlier, your Bible, right? Your Bible. There is, this, this is interesting. So there were many non-canon or non-agreed upon books that did not make it in your Bible. There were parts of the Bible that were not recognized by the original church as genuine and inspired by God, right? They, they looked at books of the Bible and said, God's fingerprint is not on that book, and they rejected it. They rejected it. They said that should not be in the Bible. There were people that claimed that Jesus did things and walked on the earth and had relationships and things that did not happen. It was, it was fake news, right? It was falsities. It was things. And they said that is not the fingerprint of God. It's not going in the Bible, which is why your book has 66 books and not more than 66. Those 66 books in your Bible are canon, and that's exactly what they called it. Amen? That's exactly what apostolic believers called it. They said that is a canon book because it's got God's signature, his fingerprint. It is inspired by God. God breathed that book. Amen? Holy Ghost-filled believers got together and determined which parts of your Bible had that true fingerprint of God. How did they do that, people ask? How did they do that? Well, they walked with him. They knew him. Amen. They, 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 they had lived with him. They understand what he did, when he did it, how he did it. They understand that. Everything in your Bible, everything in your Bible was a canon event. Amen. So the term canon event, this didn't pop up till just last year. This is kind of a new phrase that people have started using. It really caught on in the past year, I'd say, across social media. Many use the term to highlight the fact that we have all seemingly had similar experiences as we grow older. So here's an example. A girl playing dress up, as, you know, or a boy finding that good stick out in the yard. Those are canon events for most everybody, right? It's a canon event to, to, to have those experiences. It says, oh, that's just a part of growing up. Every guy thinks that way, so it was a canon event. Or every girl plays dress up or has tea parties. So it's just a canon event for all, for all these kids, right? It's a canon event. But canon events also make us look at the what ifs, right? It makes us look at the what ifs. And, 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 and we look at the what ifs across many types of storytelling. In fiction, like I had mentioned earlier, in entertainment, and even, even historical storytelling, right? Can be theorized, it can be thought about differently just by one moment of what we now call fate. It just takes one moment. It just takes one decision. It just takes one something to change everything. So, for example, I brought up Spidey, so I'll, I'll bring him up again. Had Uncle Ben not been tragically murdered by a criminal who Peter Parker refused to bring to justice with his newfound powers, right? He would have never made the personal commitment to pursue responsibility and dedicate his life to fighting evil. That's just the story of Spider-Man. His uncle dies and he learns he wouldn't have died if I had used my powers right. He says he would have learned, he would have never learned that valuable lesson that we love quoting and it became super popular. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. 
That's a great message, right? That's a great message. But you can even see this in the sports world. In the sports world, had Michael Jordan not made that game-winning shot in 1989 over the Utah Jazz, right? Utah could have boasted their very first championship, which I don't believe they've even won one, right? And one of the sports' most replayed plays of one of sports' most iconic figures could have been non-existent. This would have changed the way we, we even think of the name Michael Jordan or the number 23 on a red jersey. It would have changed everything in the sports culture. And the, and the story of American history, this, one's, this one hits us a little bit more home. If the colonies had lost the Revolutionary War, the United States might have remained under British rule. This could have either stifled or drastically delayed the country's eventual rise as a global superpower. We could be in a different country today had it not been for one decisive battle, amen? Had it not been for the actions of a General George Washington, had it not been for people that stepped up to the plate and said, we're going to make something happen, and it happened, right? Those were canon events, right? All of those exclamation mark moments stand today as more than canon events, though. They make the world that we live in right now. We are sitting in that world because of those fateful decisions and those fateful moments. Amen. So the idea of time travel has popped up, right? It was popularized especially, and I'm just giving a little bit of background. I promise we're going somewhere with this. Especially by H.G. Wells' novel in 1895 called The Time Machine. This influenced what came to be known as the golden age of science fiction. For decades to come, full of, later on we'd see blockbuster hits and novels about let's go back in time. Let's go forward in time. Let's see what the future has. Let's see what the past has, right? This was super popular. You can probably think of a few movies or books right now that have taken, that, that have been taken about time travel in some way. And with Christmas quickly approaching, many will be reading and watching a ghost story exploring the passage of time. One of my favorites, A Christmas Carol, right? Right? It's, it's, it's interesting. So The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, it, it, many, many have come to call it the gospel according to Scrooge even. Churches are putting this on and, and Bible colleges have put it on. It was, it's a, a wonderful story, but it's about the passage of time. That's not a canon work in your Bible, by the way. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But that's, that, you know, you look at that book being written. That short book is the reason we say Merry Christmas today. That short book is the reason that Scrooge lives rent-free in our head during the holidays, right? It's, it's the reason we, we've, we've heard the phrase, bah humbug, or it's, and it's likely the reason we talk about Christmas spirit as much as we do, right? But the question has been, in our world, can we travel back to prevent undesirable outcomes? Can we go back and fix it? Would the Lord allow time travel for humanity? Would he allow that? Could, could humans go back in time? Could we jump in something and make it happen, right? If there was a time machine in each of our homes today, would God give us a driver's license and the keys and say, have fun fixing all that you can? Would it happen? Would he let you do it? Hey Amen. Would he, would, he would he let us mend the mistakes of yesterday? Would he let us see our loved ones again? Would he let us see who we used to be and change who we are today? The answer is simple. You don't need a time machine to get to where you need to go. Will God let us be time travelers? The answer is yes, because we already are. We already are. We are already moving through space and time today. And we thank you for spending your, your very confined, precious time today in the house of worship. This is the only way you can move. This is God designed borders of time and space for us to live in. And that's the only way we, 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 we move and breathe. Amen. This is not eternity. This is life on planet Earth. Scientific laws still apply to us. If I jump up, I'm thankful that I come right back down. Amen. Amen. Why? Because the laws of gravity are still applicable here. You don't get to bend the rules and change the elements in this world. Amen. Well, you don't get to do that. So being that we're time travelers, we move through time and space, and we have this responsibility, we must travel wisely. And this is what I would like to talk about today. If we're always cranking up the time machine, if we're always going backwards and saying things like, well, things just ain't like they used to be anymore. 
If we're always saying, let me just take a ride down memory lane and I'll just live there and watch the reruns of revival, well, then we find ourselves in a bad place. That's not traveling wisely today, church. I can't worship with all this new stuff, but folks might say. I'm, I'm about retired out of this generation. I, let, let me sit back and relive glory. Let me just crank up the time machine and go backwards. No, no, no. Or, or folks that say, my heart was broken. I can never receive my healing. My mistakes are too great today. If only I could go back and fix that one pivotal moment. If only I could bend time to put more hours in the day if I could just put a little bit more time in the week in the month in the year and you find yourself only chasing time you don't own time you're only you're only a, a victim of time if you find yourself in that space you are not traveling wisely today church if, if people say if I could go back if I could catch up with time if there's not enough time in the day listen church that's cranking up the time machine and using it wrong today God didn't intend for us to live in the back Backwards. God didn't intend for us to even live so far in the future that we're that we can't even live where we're at today. Amen. We are supposed to be time travelers traveling at his pace today. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? Amen. 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 Some folks are always chasing time, but they're never living inside. They, they're in their bodies, but they feel like they're not living in them. Always longing for more than 24 hours or more time to do the things they need to do, but never finding time for themselves. Church, let me tell you, it is important and it is imminent that we find times to take care of our temple. It is important that we find time to take care of ourselves. We are not traveling wisely today. We're not traveling with wisdom today. If we are constantly serving others, and God appreciates how we serve others, but that verse that says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, you have to realize that means you're taking care of somebody, and you're taking care of yourself first as somebody you love. You have to realize that that means I'm taking care of someone else the same way that I shouldn't already know how to take care of myself. You have to treat yourself like somebody you care about. You should care about yourself. You should take care of yourself. Amen? People say there's not enough time to take care of myself. Yes, there is. It's, it's a matter of priorities. And, and that, that's uncomfortable. That's, that's uncomfortable for people. But it, it's, it's, it's not about, but life, even life is not about comfort. Pursuing comfort is not traveling wisely. Amen. There will never be enough time for condemnation in your spirit. When you have allowed condemnation in your spiritual system, when it gets into your spiritual bloodstream, condemnation, what does that mean? That's the devil accusing you and, and creating something in your flesh to constantly be in your own head and always saying, oh, I'm not good enough. I'll never be worthy. That's condemnation. You'll never have enough time to be able to think about those thoughts. You'll never have enough time to do enough thinking, do enough working when condemnation gets in you. Condemnation makes a day feel like 10 hours. Con Condemnation makes a moment of time feel like, feel like it, it lasts forever. It either bends time really long or bends time really short, and you have this, this disproportionate or this, this wonky sense of life that you can't, even, you can't even look straight in somebody's eye and tell them, tell them about the goodness of God. You can't even look at yourself when you look in the mirror and say, say, God loves me, Jesus loves me. This is why it's so important that our Sunday school kids are doing that, and we're teaching them, Jesus loves me this time. I know for the Bible tells me so I don't have time to listen to what everybody else says about me I don't have time to let let condemnation get in my spirit and me just think about oh there's just not enough time to really ponder and think about all the complex things of life and all that and all the checklists maybe you don't need a checklist maybe you just need to need to spend about 10 minutes in prayer amen and say God teach me how to take that first step amen that's traveling wisely today church amen we must travel wisely. You'll either die by the hand of a clock, right? Or you'll, or you'll learn how to use it to your advantage, right? If you don't understand this concept, you will die by that hand of that clock that will just keep ticking for its next victim after it takes your purchased blood. Church, you have been purchased by, a, by the blood of Christ. And he wants you, and, and, and I want to make sure that this is very clear. He is not bound by time. He can work for you when you feel like you don't have enough time to do anything. 
He can work for you. He can go ahead of you. And if you don't have faith to see that, God doesn't have much room to move. God doesn't have much room. That's not traveling wisely today. We need to travel with faith. And we need to travel carefully and not long for the nostalgia or, get this, the doctrine of DIY. I'm going to do it myself. That gets us in problems. You'll never have enough time to do it yourself. You'll never have enough time to, to, to check off everything. I, I'm all for checklists. I'm all for them. I got an app not too long ago. It's a nice little checklist. And what's really fun about it is when you check it off, you can like you can shake your phone like an etch sketch and it disappears. I like not not seeing it anymore. I like it being erased from my memory, right? I like it just just wiped out, right? But but the beautiful thing about a checklist, and probably the only beautiful thing about it, is it allows you to see what your next step is. After that, I can't find much use for it. Now, that might just be me, but some folks have a tendency to look at the whole list and think, I can't do this. But the children of God's response, it's not their response. Their response is, with Christ, I can take that first step. And if for some reason I can't get to number four or number five, I can go down to number six, number seven, come back to this later. Right? Right? I can come back to this. God doesn't leave. He, he doesn't do mistakes. He, he doesn't. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't allow us to walk with, with, with mistakes. He allows us as we walk. He's going to make sure we walk in wisdom. And if we make a mistake, he's gonna, there's going to be enough grace to cover us. Amen. How many of you are thankful for the grace of God? Amen. I need his mercy because sometimes I, tr I trip and I stumble. I look at the clock. And I say, how in the world am I going to make it to the end of, an end of this shift, at the end of this assignment, at the end of this whatever it is? And, he said, and, and I always feel God say, hey, I'm going to be here the next hour, and I'm going to be here the next hour after that. And that's traveling wisely. Amen? Praise the Lord. We travel space and time with wisdom when we surrender our hypotheticals to the healer. Right? We get so caught up in the what ifs. What if this doesn't work? What if that doesn't work? And, and, and God knows there's a decision on every heart in this place of worship today. There's a decision that you've been trying to make with the Lord for a, quite, a, a good deal of time. And the only thing holding you back are the hypotheticals. Well, if I do this, I have to live my life differently. Well, I have, if I do this, I, that's not traveling wisely today. If we learn to travel wisely, the Bible says, come unto me. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are burdened or heavy laden. He says, I'll give you rest. It is a traveling. It's, a, it's not one of those like road trips where you just, you're so exhausted exhausted all the way there. How many of you ever had a road trip like that? You're just so tired the whole way. No, no, no. Jesus says he'll give us rest along the journey. Amen. And, and, and that's why it's so important to make sure that we're traveling with wisdom, traveling, taking care of ourselves. We need to get rid of our theories about our mental and our physical and our natural limitations today. God sees that. But theorizing with God does little benefit when you could ask him for his help. When you could ask him, say, God, help me take the next step today. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are rulers under God's administration today. How many of you believe you're a ruler in the house? And it's hard to believe at first. I had a hard time lifting my hand just now because I don't feel like a ruler sometimes, right? Ruler. You, you are, you, the Bible says you're a royal priesthood. That's what it says. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means we're not victims of time. We're the head and not the tail, as Scripture says. We're, we're, we're not behind. We're not, we're not always trying to chase things. We, we, are, we seize things. We, we, take, we take the kingdom by force, as it said. We, we, are on, we, we are evaluating our opportunities and, and our priorities, and we're saying, God, I'm giving this to you, and I'm going to do great things with my schedule today because God is going to help you. Once you decide to take that first step, that second step, you begin to, as Brother Adriel was preaching about, understand that you are dependent on him. Amen. Praise the Lord. You, we are rulers of time, not victims of time. Amen. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, this is a beautiful, beautiful scripture here. If you don't believe you're a ruler today, I'm going to prove it to you. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. 
Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. That verse about God's glory didn't start until he understood who we are. Some of us can't understand who God really is because we can't look past ourselves. And when we have a revelation of who we are and how much we need him, we begin to understand that he's been the puzzle piece we needed all along today. Amen. How many of you want to, want to be rulers of your time today? Because our time is very limited. The Lord is coming back. If you haven't heard it in a little while, that's okay. Because I want to be the voice to tell you today, the Lord is coming back today. And he's coming back for a church that knows that they are not victims of time, but they're rulers of time, taking advantage of opportunities to, to make it right with him and to tell the world about him today. Amen. No candidate event is greater than our king today. And I challenge checked it out already. The Bible says that the glory days were not yesterday. You don't have to jump in a time machine to get back to the glory days. You don't have to jump in a time machine to get all the way to the end. Amen. If we don't make the most of today, we will not see the final day. That is the fact. That is a fact of scripture. If we don't make the most of today, we will not see the final day. Amen. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to be apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. Amen. God's children learn how to delete the mistakes of the past and look forward. Amen. They learn God's children are not time victims. Amen. We are doers because in James 1 and 22, it says, but be ye doers of of the word, not hearers only. And this is important, deceiving your own selves. It says, so basically, if you look at this, it says, if you're just, it says, it says, you're doing the word, you're not just listening to it. If you're only listening to it, you are lying to yourself. You are lying to yourself that you are a Christian if you are listening to the word and not doing it. God help us. That verse convicts me. Amen. We talk about hypocrisy syndrome. This is the thing that mental illness people talk about. They say, they say, they say, therapists are this hypocrisy syndrome. Oh, I look in the mirror and I just feel like a hypocrite. I don't deserve anything, right? You're deceiving yourselves. You're lying to yourselves. We're to be doers of the word. Amen. This is a beautiful book. This book tells you that you win. Amen. This is why we got to keep it going. We got to keep the word going. You're deceived if you believe that time is your issue because time is not your issue today. Amen. If you feel like you're behind, time is not your issue. Time has always happened since the beginning. You've always been on the clock. Amen. You've always been on the clock. It's just a matter of our habits in the middle. Amen. We can make good decisions today. They say, when's the best time to make better decisions right now? Because that's time. That's time. The sooner the better. Amen. The best time to make a better decision to repent at an altar of repentance and say, God, I'm making a new commitment. Some people think that when we say, hey, you need to repent, we're saying, hey, you need to say you're sorry. That's not what we're saying. When we say repent at an altar of forgiveness, when we say repent at an altar of repentance, we're saying it's time to make a new commitment because repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Repentance is saying I'm turning away from those things. I'm not cranking up the time machine and going back to those things anymore. Amen. I'm not jumping on that time machine and going back I'm making a commitment to move forward and I'm going to actually travel because I can make a new commitment today at an altar today amen praise the Lord this is how to spot the devil by the way this is how to spot the devil how to spot demonic activity if you ever wonder where he's at here's how you can find him he used when you are in a situation you can spot the devil the past is used to condemn you if your past is used to condemn you, you can always spot the devil right there. Why? Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's constantly condemning you. And here's another way. Someone keeps repeating your failure on loop. Somebody keeps repeating. You make any mistake and somebody's got to call it out. Somebody got to call it out and make a, make a spectacle out of you and make you. Let me tell you, that is demonic. There is nothing of God in that moment. That's just cranking up that old time machine that should have been collecting dust anyway. That's just cranking up that old time machine and trying to take you backwards. Amen. We are time travelers moving through time and space. And that's, tr that's not traveling wisely when you decide that to, to agree with the devil or agree with people that the devil's using in your life to bring up your past. Amen. That's how you spot demonic activity. 
identity is when your past is on loop and on loop and saying it's you're hopeless. There's nothing you can do. Let me tell you today, there is hope today and you don't have to jump on that time machine. You don't have to jump back down and go down memory lane. Amen. The Bible says we are looking forward today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Constantly condemning you, beating you up over some silly mistake. God has already paid ransom for. Praise the Lord. Aren't we thankful? We said earlier, we're thankful for his mercy. Amen. As I close, amen. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 through 6, as we read earlier. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, meaning you too, a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You don't need more time. You need more commitment and to godly time travel today. You need more time commitment today to traveling wisely today. Why? Because we're traveling to New Jerusalem together. I want to go to heaven with each and every person in this room right now. I want to go to heaven with each and every person listening under the sound of my voice on Spotify and podcasts and YouTube and the rest of them. Amen. I want to, I want to go to heaven with those folks today. And it's not going to happen if we, if we just ignore responsibility and try to live in the past. Amen. Everyone moves through space and time the same way we all do. Everyone has the same responsibility to testify. Amen. So, so here's what we do with the past. Here's what we do with the past. We don't just ignore it. Here's what we do with it. It is useful. I've talked about how we don't need to go back, but there is something we can do with the past. And what we can do with the past is number one, reflect. We can reflect on the past. That's okay. We can do that. But we can also react to the, to the past with a godly attitude. We can react to it. And we can respond with gratitude for what he's brought us from today. Amen. We can rejoice about your testimony. And that's a beautiful part because we get to do that in front of everybody. Those first three, you can do that on your own. But when it comes to testifying, I, I, we, we get to do that amongst each other. We get to testify. Amen. That's how you spot a godly person right there. Somebody that lives with gratitude and will testify. And, 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 and will tell somebody about how God has moved in their lives. Why? And this is my last verse today as we stand across this house of worship. I want to read Revelation chapter 12. This is a beautiful verse of scripture. When I, when I first began these notes, I said, God, I, I, I'm not really feeling that. I don't know what you're trying to speak to me because God, he'll speak to me first and, and I, it'll hit me on a personal level. And then I'll, I'll say, God, I, I suppose that's what you want me to share with others. But this verse right here was the confirmation that this is what the Lord really wanted to say today. It was in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. It says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength. I I want us to just soak that in a minute. Now is the time for salvation and strength. Amen. It doesn't matter what happens this week, Brother Charles. It doesn't matter what happens this week. Now is the time for strength and salvation for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of our God. That's literally the next verse. And our next word in that verse. And it says, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Amen. The enemy's already defeated today in the house which accused them before our God day and night, meaning the devil is doing relentless work to discourage the church. The devil is doing relentless work to make sure you live on condemnation on loop, that you're constantly thinking the only way you can ever make anything happen that's worthwhile is if you crank up the old time machine, go back and live in the past. But let me tell you, the revival you need to be a part of was not the one that happened five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. The revival Revival we need to be a part of is the one happening today. Amen. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Let me tell you, church, if you are struggling today with the accuser, if the accuser is beating you up, you shouldn't put up with it. And you need to quote Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and say, I'm going to overcome you by the blood of the lamb and by the word of my testimony today, because revival is right here in the house of worship right here in my life committed to you Jesus that says therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath but I want to catch this right here because he knoweth that he hath but a short time when I see someone testifying I see a time traveler is what I see 
I see a time traveler who's been purchased by the one who gave himself for ransom for all. To be testified in due time, as that verse said. It's due time to quit with the excuses. Let me tell you, excuses can be spotted a mile away from a se- by someone who's seasoned in prayer. Amen. It's, it's time to stop that. It's like a cancer. Excuses are like a cancer. It's like a disease that just spreads. And it does you no good. It does nobody else any good. There's no reason to have excuses in the house of worship. There's only love on the other side when you throw those away. Amen. It's time to stop complaining about being a time victim and start being a time traveler under glory. God did not design you to fail. That's the devil's job. That's the kingdom of this world's job. They're trying to design you to fail. They're trying to create you differently than how you were intended. But you were designed for success. So if you're constantly down on yourself and in your own head, do the Bible math. Who's talking there? Who's talking there? We're designed to have a relationship with God and hear his voice. Amen. We're designed to have a relationship with a savior who says you win. Amen. It's like that old song said, I looked in the back of the book. Amen. I looked in the back of the book and I saw we win is the, is the idea of the song. I saw that we win. We're in that book. You are in that book if you're a winner today in the house of worship. Amen. Psalm chapter 90 verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. How many of you want to apply your hearts unto wisdom today and travel wisely today? Amen. That's what I want to do today. That's what I want to do today. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, God, for the promises of your word. Thank you, God, for what you've done in our hearts and in our minds today, God. Lord, first and foremost, before we leave this place of worship, God, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that we, Lord Jesus, that you would honor a newfound commitment today, a new, newfound altar to make a commitment today, Jesus, God. Lord, We repent today of our sins. We make a commitment today, Jesus, God. Lord, not because we necessarily did anything wrong, God, or or, or we felt accused or we're moving out of fear, God, but because we know that love is on the other side, Lord Jesus, of of quitting the excuses and quitting the complaining and quitting the the victim of God. We, We know, Lord Jesus, God, that everybody's a victim of time, Lord Jesus, and the only way we can break that curse, God, we can break through that today, Jesus, is if we reach out, God, Lord, and we allow your blood to cover us, God. You live outside of space and time today, Jesus, and you're ready to, God, embrace, Lord, each and every heart and every soul today in the house of worship today, God. You're ready to love each and every heart, Lord Jesus, each and every mind, each and every soul today, God. You see the torment, God. You see the the frustration, the struggles that nobody talks about, God. Lord, you see those dark places, Lord. But, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I speak a word of comfort, God. God, to each of those souls. God, I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to travel wisely, God, in these last days. Teach us to travel wisely, God, and not think that we have to revisit the past, God, to search for answers. God, our, pra- our, our answers are not in the past, God. Our answers, God, Lord, are right here in your word, God, which is, Lord, timeless today, God. We bless you, God. We give you honor in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's be travelers today. Let's be wise travelers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We pray that it blessed you. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel or submit some positive feedback on your favorite podcast app and share it with a friend. God bless in Jesus' name.